Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three adventures from Expeditious Retreat Press uh, and their Advanced Adventures line. I'm going to be going through, well, really I'm going to be going through five adventures. You know, I usually do these reviews in sets of three, uh, and I think I sort of still am, because even though I'm going through five adventures, three of them are in one series. They're the Shadow Vein series, which is Advanced Adventures number one, Advanced Adventures number 23, and Advanced Adventures number 24. Uh, Pod Caverns of the Sinister Shroom Men, Down in the Shadow Vein, and Mouth of the Shadow Vein. And then I'm going to be going back to number two and doing the Red Mausoleum, and then I'll be finishing up with Curse of the Witch Head, which is Advanced Adventures number three. I'm going to be going through all of these relatively quickly. These are only 17, 18 pages each. They're not that long. So it won't be too hard to uh, cover all of these in a reasonable amount of time. Now, first of all, the thing I want to mention right away is the art. Cover artist is Stefan Poag, and interior artist is Matthew Finch. So you know you're getting amazing art throughout all of these books. If you saw the monster manual or the three monster manual um, for your game that I just released, three different unique monster manual, manuals or something like that. I forget the title that I put uh, on the video. But the last of those was from the Advanced Adventures set. Now this is designed for Osric, but any old school game will do. And you can get the rules for free. Uh, there's links in these PDFs um, down below. So you can get Osric if you don't have it. But you can also use your OSR game of choice because it's not terribly difficult to, to convert. So the Pod Caverns of the Sinister Shroom, it's an adventure for characters level 2 through 4. It's kind of an interesting way to start off their set, not a level 1 adventure. So you kind of have to have already done something when you get here, but that's okay because there are, if you get the whole adventure pack, which I got in a Humble Bundle, but if you get the whole adventure pack or you get any of the other adventures, there's lots of level 1 adventures that they have. Just their initial set isn't level 1. That's kind of funny, but, you know, we've seen the level 1 adventures quite a lot, so... Now, when you get the actual text of the adventure, you're looking at old school design, long paragraphs of text with very little bolding or italics to help differentiate, no bullet points. They're not no bullet points, but relatively few throughout. Um, you know, you're looking at old school design. That's going to turn some people off. That's going to really um, you know, engage other people who are familiar with it and love that, like the paragraphs of text. You get a lot of information. Not all of it's useful, not all of it's necessary, but a lot of it is, and you do have to kind of read through to find out and to differentiate which is which. So in that regard, the format of the book, it's not my favorite. I prefer the much more snappy, bullet point, agile design than the old school block text of paragraphs. You have to read through the whole thing to kind of get a sense of what's going on. But it still is laid out very well, and the writing is good. And I've noticed that about all these adventures that I've read through. The writing is very good, so you can't complain about it. It's just one of those things. It's a design choice, right? This is going for mimicking an older style, then aiming at, you know, just pick it up and play at the table. There's a key to the first level. You get the, the map of the first level of the pod, Caverns of the Sinister Shroom, right away, which is good. I'm glad that they don't just put it in the back. You get it right away. The room descriptions here are great. Essentially, you're going through a, a, uh, you know, a tunnel system, a cave system, and you're following this river down. And that's really cool because this entire series is based on the river, the shadow vein. And so you start at the entrance following this stream into the caves, and you go down and down and down and down and down until you get to the shadow vein, which is this big underground river. And the second and third adventures are adventures along that giant river in the Underdark. So this would be a really cool adventure to have if you were doing like a longer term, uh, you know, adventure underground. If you wanted to do a Shadow Dark campaign or a Shadow Dark adventure. Not, sorry, not Shadow Dark, Under Dark, excuse me. Not Shadow Dark. I want to apologize, by the way. I'm, I'm still recovering from an illness, so if I sniffle or cough, my voice sounds weird. That's, that's why. So just FYI, apologize ahead. There's a cool waterfall here. Um, a goo chamber, I always like something with a goo chamber. The mad tree room, and you have to fight mad trees. A pod man. And, you know, you're dealing with these pod people in this adventure. The shambling mounds. You know, you get the sets giant leeches. This is going to be a wet, gross, icky adventure. I like that. It's going to, like, you know, squelching. You can almost hear it squelching. But there have these been these people going missing, and so there are prisoners, and there's, a, you know, cages you can find with people inside um, those 
those cages. You can rescue them. Perhaps that's why you were brought here in the first place, is to rescue these people. Uh, cage A has the daughter of a wealthy merchant. Um, cage D has a fighter from, the, from that caravan where the wealthy merchant's daughter was. Um, everyone's trying to be pod converted, right? That's this idea. Is all the, or not, they're trying to, but the pod people are going to convert them in their pods. And so it's a little like the invasion of the body snatchers, right? Or something like that. You could make this a much bigger adventure as, you know, people have gone missing. If it's, if it's a level, you could have a level one adventure on the surface, but you'd have to come up with it. Where, you know, people are going missing, there are these creepy pod people that have replaced them or something like that. And you fight them and then you find their, their source and you come down here. So that could be a, a one thing to do. Now, what's interesting is that this adventure is said to be standalone, and yet it's also the first in the series. And you'll see why at the very end it all kind of allows for that. Here's the second level of the pod, Caverns of the Sinister Shroom. There's a portcullis trap, a captured treant, hanging snagwort's vampiric moth, moss, leaf loam is the, uh, is the captured treant, leaf loam. It's great. There's a piranha waterfall. And the ideas in this book are really good. It, it's really easy to fall into a, when you're, especially when you're designing like a cavern system, I have found that it's really easy to be boring. This adventure is not boring in its description of a cavern, which I think is really hard to do and really cool. There's interesting stuff happening in these different caverns. Funny stuff, you know, engaging things. Here's one of the pod men. Pod cultivation chambers. Now, obviously, this is a certain tone. Pod people and pod cultivation chambers. It's not necessarily science fiction, but it is certainly not standard fantasy. So some people are going to, you know, bounce off that. Some people are going to like that. You get down here and there is a... Um, uh, like a vat. I mean, someone's doing this, right? It's not just accidental. <laughs> uh, there's the shroom who is who is actually doing this. The sinister shroom is just a particular person or a particular NPC villain who is making this happen. Has put together a laboratory, has put together uh, all of these things, and is, you know, trying to turn people into these pod men. You get a series of documents with what's kind of going on and the details of the process. So maybe there's someone who wants it. Maybe there's an NPC who wants all that stuff. There's the shroom, you know, typical shroomy villainous person with a bunch of potions. And this is fun too, because there's a bunch of crazy potions. Sometimes they're just kind of more normal. Sometimes they're really not so normal. Um, there's potions that don't do anything. There's fish oil. There's lots of poisons. There's ink. Uh, there's an empty that's not actually empty. It has a potion of healing. There is unholy water. Um, there's a bottle that is painted black. It contains glass beads and a ring. None of those things are magical. One of them I like is bottle 17. The bottle contains liquid wood. When the earthy, smelling brown liquid is poured out, it will freeze in 10 seconds into solid wood in whatever shape the liquid had assumed before it froze. That's a really cool idea, and you could use that. Adventurers could use that. Um, maybe I would put a couple of those bottles, that way they could test one without wasting it, because there's only one right now. And there's a couple empty ones, a couple extra poisons I'd swap out maybe, just so they would have one to test, and then they'd have a backup to use at some point in an adventure, because that's something that I could see clever players finding a use for. And that's kind of cool. Um, and there's no, actually there is another one, number, bottle, bottle 20 as well. And then you get uh, the shroom room, the sinister shroom itself, and the fungemoth, which is of course you know a giant <laughs> fungal monster, cavern of the fungemoth. And then there's level three of the pod caverns of the sinister shroom. So this is actually a pretty big dungeon. You're going down 47, no, 50 rooms, 52 rooms. Yeah, 52 rooms. That's Again, quite, quite large for a 17-page adventure. They managed to pack all that here. Not every room has combat. Not every room has something fascinating here. There are random encounters, a small random encounter table at the first page. But you could, you could expand this if you wanted it to be a bit more, you know, faction-y. There are some factions in here. There's Rogue Podmen, for example. And they won't necessarily like the others, right? There are things that are going on in here that might let you kind of turn some things uh, around against each other. Um, now, there's also a ghast down here. It sounds like, um, or rather, Guzutsuk, Guzuk, I can't know how to say that name. She's a goblin, and there are other goblins um, down here. And again, there's a ghast who's been trying to talk to these goblins, but you could maybe kill the ghast and uh, 
turn the goblins to your side. One of the things that's a little bit harder to figure out what to do here is there isn't really, it doesn't seem to me, any way to get to level 3 without going through level 2. And so if you wanted to turn the goblins against the pod men or vice versa or something, you can't really do that easily. But it wouldn't be too hard to add a side tunnel or something down here so that the goblins, you can get to the goblins and have that more faction play. Um, anyway, there's other things you can do down here. Uh, bear traps, of course, giant frogs, piercers. It wouldn't be a cave without piercers. And then you have the concluded the adventure section along with new monsters for the Osric system using those stat blocks. But they're pretty easy. I mean, the stat blocks are long, but if you look at the details, it's actually fairly straightforward like most other systems. Now, one thing it says is, right, if you come down to these, so I'll read through the concluding the adventure. The adventure's conclusion obviously depends upon the direction the adventurers took through the dungeon. If the module was used as the exit from a series of adventures on an underground river, the emergence to the surface will be the beginning of the next challenge, a blank slate for the GM's next fiendish plot. If, on the other hand, the party explored downward through the Shroom's domains, the discovery of the underground river coupled with the goblins' canoes will suggest an interesting course of action. What wonders and perils will they face if they choose to ride the river into deeper depths? Only the Game Master knows. So it's sort of an interesting, like, hey, if you started at the bottom of the dungeon, you could go up. Or if you started at the top of the dungeon, you could go down. So either this could be the first adventure in a series of underground adventures, or it could be the last. That's kind of cool. I wish it had more reason to take these uh, these um, canoes. One thing that might happen, and this would be easy enough to do, would be to have there be a cave collapse or something. Right? The players cannot go back up. They have to go downriver. That'd be kind of an interesting way to force the players to keep going. But you could start off the adventure that way, right? Like they come into the adventure and they come into the first cave and the cave collapses behind them for whatever reason. And then they have to go down here. It could even be an accident, right? They're, they're traveling through, there's an earthquake or something. They're chased by some monsters. A giant, a giant is chasing them and they have to hide in a cave and he smashes it and it collapses the entrance to the cave. And now they're stuck down here and they just have to go down and find their way out. You know, it could be something like that. That wouldn't be too hard. Now, this document does have a few pages of extra monsters, and again, the art in this book is great. It's incidental. It's not incidental. It's not every page, obviously, but when you see it, it's good. I like it a lot. Then there's the open gaming license, and again, that final page. This one has the, you know, the final page actually, the cover, and the back cover is always on the last page of the PDF. I moved it to the front page for some of these documents, but mostly it's on the last page. So, yeah, that's the Pod Caverns of the Sinister Shroom. It's a cool idea. I like it. It's a good cave adventure, and it's great that it's the beginning of a series of adventures. The next one is Down in the Shadow Vein, and it kind of continues on right away after that. As the back cover says, you carefully load your canoes and launch into the fast-moving rivers of the ever of waters of the underground river named Shadow Vein. The pod caverns of the Sinister Shroom behind you, the veracity of the map that is to be your guide into the dark will soon be tested. So you get the uh, adventure of Down the Shadow Vein. I really like that piece of art. Once again, you have the, uh, the cover artist is Stefan Poeg. The interior artists are William McCosland and Claudia Pozas, I think is how you say that. I'm actually not sure. Pozas. Pozas. So this is just another adventure for that. Now this is going to be, this is much more, I would say, like a fractured adventure. It's much less linear in one sense. It's much less like you're going to, you know, here's a dungeon with a bunch of rooms. This is a river. And with, with like sort of stops along the way as you're going down. Shadow Vane is one of those rare underground rivers traveling for miles and miles just below the surface. Reaching almost 100 feet wide at its widest, the river flows fast and slow with the changing underground terrain, but favors slow, excepting a few areas. It's traversable in most locations, only dropping its ceiling to the waterline a few times in its long course, resulting in portage areas. You have random encounters in the deeps because a lot of this is going to be kind of traveling and moving through, and so the... Uh, the random encounter tables are a bit more important here. And, and they're not all combats. You have merchants and a character party that you can run into. Um, actually, two different uh, merchant caravans along with the character party. So, um, you know, it's, it's actually pretty cool in that way. Now, here's the map of the underdeeps surrounding the Shadow Vane River. And the black hexes are the ones that are detailed in this series. There are other ones that are not detailed in a module of this series, which means that have, they have a whole bunch of connection points that are up to you to sort of decide if you want to do it. Now, what's interesting is they have a primary passage, a secondary passage, and a tertiary passage. Each hex equals a mile. So you can follow the river very clearly 
that's actually the way it sort of imagines. But if for whatever reason you didn't want to follow the river, right, you could have this be a much more like a race, perhaps. Maybe there's another adventuring party trying to get down to the end of it for whatever reason. Maybe there's some thing that you're trying to go quickly or trying to stay off the river. Whatever it might be, there are opportunities here to expand this massively, as you can see. And it's a really cool map. The connection points are really fun. And the fact that, that you have really you know, lots and lots of uh, routes through the under, Underdeep, as it's called here, that's super cool. It's laid out very well. Now, you know, height isn't necessarily clear, but you're on a river, right? Which means that it's only going to be going downhill. So it's not like you're going to have these massive climbs up, at least if you follow the river itself. So that's, you know, it's not like height is impossible to imagine here. You know, you have to think in three, three dimensions instead of just two, because you're looking <laughs> at, at, a, at a cave system. But still, it does a great job of showing you where you are, where you can go. And I, 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 whenever I see this map, I'm super tempted to run a kind of adventure like this and have a whole bunch of, you know, nodes go between. I just love it. I'm not sure why I love it so much, but I do. So anyway, it's definitely a, a good one, I think. And then you have, um, so primary passage, secondary passage, and tertiary passage, random encounters. And the tertiary passages are more dangerous, it seems to me, than the primary and the secondary passages. Um, and then you have if they're, if they're above certain depth or below certain depth. So it kind of does, you know, it does take depth into consideration. And then it has a breakdown of each of the possible, or at least some of the possible encounters you could run into, along with the, the Noja merchant caravans. Noja are, the, are creatures you can run into down here. And, and then you can run into other things, dwarves, goblins, hobgoblins, fire beetles, zombies, shriekers. You know, nothing in the a random encounter table is like, whoa, crazy, in, unique, or individual. It's an old school game in that way. It's not, it's not giving you like these incredibly bespoke encounters each time, right? It's going to be, the interest is going to be from the reaction table, from the, com the particular combination of uh, creatures that you roll. I might add in something like a complication table and a disposition table, just so that you have, you know, you roll three times and you combine them so you have an encounter, a disposition, and a complication, and then you can roll for reaction. That makes it much more interesting to me. To have that those those common more for the players to interact with on standard encounter tables. You have encounter areas as you go through, but again, each encounter area is kind of its own unique place. They're sort of mini dungeons. Some of them are, are larger than others, but the goblin lair is a fairly sizable goblin lair. Uh, you can go through it. Now, three and four, those little um, side tunnels, lead to other locations, as does two. So you can follow the river, or you can go down. You know, say you lost your your canoes, or say you decided you were going to go overland, you could take those other tunnels instead of just following the river. That's kind of cool. This is a pretty deadly, in, in one sense it seems to be pretty deadly, because it's like a, it's a goblin lair, so if you just are level 2 characters or something, level th well, maybe level 3 characters, as this is level 3 through 5, you're going to be running into a lot of goblins. And there's two goblin guards, 12 goblins, um, in the killing field area. There's 32 goblins in the goblin housing. I mean, there's a lot of goblins here. Uh, 10 more back behind, 10 more back there, 20 more in the guard room back there in Snat's chamber, just in front of Snat's chamber. There's a shamaness. Yeah, this is actually, I would say, pretty, pretty hard. 23 goblins in the goblin housing section. If they all attack you, you're going to be just dead. So probably you're not going to want to fight your way through. Maybe you are. But, you know, probably you're going to want to find a way through or around. You might skip it entirely if you're, you know, really worried about it. You have a bugbear underlayer. So you have goblins and you have bugbears. Um, again, you have like, uh, I would say these aren't the most exciting creatures, goblins and bugbears. But it's done in a really good way. It's not done in, any, in, a, in a way that's uh, just boring. It's a well-executed standard goblin and bugbear lair. And things get more interesting as you go down, like the Noja trading post. Um, the Noja found this cave occupy a few trog occupied by a few troglodytes, and they somehow convinced them to leave. Noja are described somewhere. I don't remember exactly where they're described, but they're not, they're not a standard uh, underdark race. They're, they're under dark, uh, under deep race. You have dwarves down here, you have Sner Sver Smer ah, I can never say this word. Sverfneblin. Sverfneblin, yeah. You have those as well. 
this is actually a fairly peaceful place. This is a trading post, so you can come in here, you can deal with the different... Um, yeah, no violence can be done near the statue. No, it does not prevent theft. <laughs> There's a guard room there. Um, basically, you cannot do violence down here. It prevents you from doing it entirely. Another really cool location. Again, you're probably not going to fight your way through here. This is much more role play, it seems to me. But you could. Um, there's a Dwarven Hold, where you're going to run to the Dwarves. This is great. A solid Dwarven place with a bridge over the river. I think that's really cool. Laid out really well. Organized in the way that a Dwarven place would be organized, right? I mean, absolutely. That's one, one thing you can be certain of about the Dwarves, is that they are going to be organized well. Again, another place where you're probably not necessarily just going to fight. You could, but these dwarves are not necessarily evil. In fact, their alignments are usually lawful good, uh, looking through their alignments. So these are probably going to be helpful to you. But it could be a kind of a place of refuge, or like the last refuge before you go down. The Snide Dungeon of the Mad Mage Halleck. This is a really interesting little dungeon. It's essentially a series of traps and tricks where the players are going to find it and like if they really push and push and push and push and push and push they might find the ending but they're going to have to push and push to find the ending um there's a cobra nest there's a maiden unfair a watery tunnel a vacuum room uh a long and winding road a troubled bridge over water <laughs> there's a giant gar um that's a, uh, and there's also a very old white dragon at the very end. Uh, now that's that's pretty crazy, right? A white dragon at the end of your adventure. Um, got to be careful about that. Now he's only got six hit dice. He's got forty-two hit points though. Um, it's chaotic evil, so he's just gonna blast you. Yeah. And there's a chest that he's curled around, so it's pretty. I'm not sure what I would say. It's pretty gamey. Right? There's just an old white dragon hanging out at the very end of this dungeon with nowhere to go. Where did he come from? What does he eat? He's just there. It's like, all right. <laughs> Here's a description of the Noja. Um, or at least the, uh, yeah, I don't know of a description of them, but this general information about them. And then you get the Undal, Weird Wolves, and a player's map, which is really cool with marks on it for a different location, why you might go, you know, what might be there. I think that's cool. Now this one is a 25 page document, so it's a little longer. Uh, this is into the Shadow Vein, or down the Shadow Vein, excuse me. Mouth of the Shadow Vein is the third adventure, and this is for levels three through five. It's designed for six to 10 adventurers. So if you've been going down this Shadow Vein for a while and you've lost characters, which might happen, you, you'd probably find a, want to find a way to add more to the party. And that wouldn't be too hard to do, right? You could find underground slavers taking some adventurers somewhere, or you could find, you know, a, a trading post or people lost in the dark or something. It wouldn't be too hard to add people back to the party. Once again, we have Stefan Poeg, and then interior artist is John Bingarn. Bingham? Bingham. I thought it was an R-N. <laughs> Bingham, <laughs> it looks like. Mouth of the Shadow Vein. This is, again, the third part of this series. This is also 25 pages, so it's a little longer than the other ones that we've seen, which is about 17. At least I, I've seen a lot of them be about 17 pages. So once again, you have random encounters in the deeps. Once again, you have the same map that was given before, but this is going to detail further locations down there. Random encounters, uh, again, as you go forward and down the tertiary passages, are more dangerous. And this is where you start to get much more, I think, much more dangerous locations. You get the Caves of Insanity, which, you know, if the players are going to actually map this old school, uh, that's going to be a labyrinth. Good luck mapping that, right? But if you get to the very end of it, there is a place <laughs> in the interior of the caves. Um, it's not too hard to find if you get lucky. Because you just go down that first tunnel, you skip the first right, you take the second right, and then you take the next left, you get into the actual location. So, you know, it's, it's skip the first right, even if you take the first right, it's a dead end. Take the second right, take the second left. That's not that hard to do fairly early on, but if you take any of the other side passage, the third side passage, if you follow the old adage, right, good adventurers go left, you're going to end up kind of lost. Which I think is interesting. But anyway, the Caves of Insanity. Now there's the Maze of Doors, the Workshop, the Wraith Quarters. There's a treasure room down here with a lot of good treasure. 
a lot of good treasure. In the chests, there's just <clears throat> trapped chests and, and trick chests and things, but there's a lot of coins, a lot of spell books, uh, a lot of items. You get bags of tricks, potions of fire resistance, staff of withering a javelin, plus three, potion of gaseous form, pair of gauntlets of overpower, and a footman's flail, plus two, along with lots and lots of spells. Um, chain lightning, enchant an item, legend, lore, move earth. So if you get here and you get through this place and you get through all those things, and you manage to defeat the Lich, because, by the way, this is the Lair of a Lich. Then you get a whole bunch of stuff. There's a Grimlock raiding party. Minor encounter. The Severf Neblin mining camp. That's also pretty cool to have along the way. Cavern of the Pod God. This is a much bigger cavern with some ruins in here. Only some of them are detailed. And, and some of them are just more mentioned at. But this is sudden the scale gets a lot bigger, right? And you're sailing in on one side. You have to kind of port over... And so you have to cross over land to the far side if you want to continue down. I think that's really cool. This could be a whole series of adventures in this area. And it's pretty cool, too. What's going on there is fun. There's a fungi growing, forests, mushroom forests, things like that. Old ruins, drow, old ruins that have been uh, overrun. I think it's really cool there. Uh, yeah, Molgus is down here. The Gate of Screams. You don't necessarily want to go through something called the Gate of Screams. At least I don't. Green Death Isle. I think this is the very end. Yeah, and what you have at the very end is a flying saucer. <laughs> this is going to be, uh, you know, again, not to some people's tastes. The, the mixing of sci-fi and fantasy, some people just don't like it. Other people don't care at all, or they like it in here, in their adventures. They really aim at these sort of adventures. That's what you get here is a flying saucer. Now, there's also an adult crustacean dragon. That's awesome. A crustacean dragon, uh, but you get a you get a you know a, a alien ship. <laughs> That's what you're running through <clears throat> with some new magic items in here as well, and some new monsters, including the crustacean dragon, which is seems pretty tough. And then again, another player map of the Underdeeps. So that is Mouth of the Shadow Vein. That's the whole Shadow Vein set. Pod caverns of the Sinister Shroom. Down the Shadow Vein and Mouth of the Shadow Vein. I really, really like them together because you get that traveling down the river. There are these sort of, you know, set piece adventures as you go down. It has sort of an episodic feel to it, almost like the Odyssey or Star Trek. Or, you know, you get the point. Like, it's episodic. You're going to go to this location and have an adventure there. Then you're going to go to the next adventure uh, location and have an adventure there. And it's sort of a series of linked adventures. But the players do have choice if you give them that map and you expand out other locations that are connected to those nodes then they would really have reasons to go around. And you could make this a whole campaign traveling down around the Shadow Vein, dealing with people. Maybe there's some threat growing at the bottom that you have to unite the dwarves and the Sphere from Nibblin and the Noja to fight, or maybe there's some, you know, who knows what's going on. I think you could use this as a basis of an amazing campaign. Or you could run it as is and have a great little episodic, uh, you know, adventure. As I said, I wanted to cover two more adventures just because I kind of think of those as one adventure. They all are kind of parts of the same adventure. So the second one I wanted to cover in that case is the Red Mausoleum. Now, this is a high-level adventure from level 12 through 15. This is the second of their of the adventures they produced. And it's an adventure for levels 12 through 15. That's really uncommon. You don't usually see high-level adventures. The Red Mausoleum. It's an interesting one. The populated region north of the Sister Moors have enjoyed over a century of respite from the wars that once plagued the area. However, within the past year, baronial patrols have reported clashes with undead and other dark creatures brave enough to strike out from the moors into the forests of men and elves. The Baron Sage suspects that the undead issue out of the mysterious ancient landmark known as the Red Mausoleum, located somewhere on the wild stretches of the moors. It's a cool idea, so you're going out to deal with these, these uh, creatures here. Another an excellent piece of art here. I love it. Old school. The Red Mausoleum, again, for adventure, an adventure for characters level 12 through 15. Once again, you get the same formatting here. Uh, notes to the GM, uh, background to the adventure. The nearest point of civilization is Rouson Point, a collection of buildings centered on a small garrison. That's where you're going to start, probably. There's some rumor tables, <coughs> or a, a D10 rumor table. And then the Sister Moors themselves, which is the region. A nice piece of map to give you a sense of what, or a nice piece of map, a nice piece of art to give you a sense of what you're looking at, as well as encounters through these moors. Uh, it says <laughs> the GM is encouraged to not spare the random encounter rolls as the PC should have several encounters before reaching the mausoleum. 
Swiglin, there's a druid you can run into, a slightly mad druid. The mausoleum itself, and uh, the platform to get in. The first key to the first level, the hidden temples. Wandering monsters are just d6. Zombie, ghouls, whites, and shadows. So uh, random encounter tables aren't fairly, aren't robust. They're just a very simple random encounter table. Now there's a couple things that are interesting here in this dungeon. One is the unknown tongue. Crypt areas occupied by special encounters, as detailed below, will have names carved into the sarcophagus itself in an unknown tongue. Read magic or similar spells will translate the inscription 60% of the time. However, the etymology behind the language is so ancient that the names will have little syntax meaning. Randomly generated encounters will have no such details, or the details were weathered or removed at some point in the past. So, you know, just if they want to figure out who's who. Then they have this other thing, the red weave. In certain encounters, the PCs will encounter a material used as tapestries or rugs. It is crimson red in color and feels metallic, yet it is almost weightless to the touch. It appears to be woven from strands of some unidentified material that resists cutting and normal damage. If the PCs procure some of the material and take it to the metal smith, the artisan may, through the use of magical force, be able to fashion armor at a ratio of 10 feet square, uh, 10 square feet, excuse me, for each human-sized suit of clothing. The material will carry the weight of leather armor, yet provide protection equal to AC3. Thieves wearing such armor will suffer no armor penalties. Magic users will find, however, that red, the red weave generates a dampening field that inhibits spell use. So, great for thieves, not so good for wizards. Now, the dungeon itself is really well laid out. It's in sort of wings. It's not really, like, looped. So you kind of pick a direction, you go and explore everything down there, then you pick another direction and explore everything in that direction. So it's not, in that sense, such an interesting dungeon in terms of choice. But it's an interesting dungeon in terms of what's going on here. And the combats themselves are fun. The treasure you can get is fun. It's a high-level dungeon, so you're dealing with a lot of very hard fights, crypt things and things like that. And... Again, it's very, very flavorful. A great tomb. If you're playing a high-level adventure and you want players to kind of go back to, like, a dungeon crawl for a bit, because by that point, by 12, level 12, 13, 14, 15, you're not really doing dungeon crawls, at least in my experience, the same way. So it's a throwback encounter. Like, hey, guys, we're going to do a dungeon crawl. This is a good one um, at that high level of play. And there's some really tough fights in here. The second level is a bit more looped. I like that. And so, you know, you get more choice as you go through it. The second level, of, which is the catacombs. Now you have just, again, the same descriptions, things you have mummies. Um, the guy's wearing the crown of Tarks. He can summon 1d1 1 through 20 skeletons three times a week. Uh, it only works the hands of undead, so the players can't get their hand on that. But it's just suddenly you're fighting a mummy, and then suddenly there's, you know, 20 extra skeletons in there. By level 12 through 15, 20 skeletons is not a hard, not a hard thing. And you get the final level, the third level, the Abodes of Unlife. This is pretty tough down here. You're dealing with some very nasty things. There are no wandering undead present in the trapped crypt, but there are some random encounters you can still run into. This is the heart of the museum and the source of the undead troubles. Great piece of art there, creepy. The Abode of Womanly Wiles. <laughs> the Collapsed Passage, the Watery Escape, the Cradle of Unlife. The Harbingers of the Abyss, the Lord of the Mausoleum. Geharis, the Lord of the Red Mausoleum and Lich, resides here amidst the splendors he has accumulated over the years. The former cleric magic user of 21st 19th level with 132 hit points. He uses illusory magic to hide his rotting appearance. It's very, very difficult. And then you get some magic items at the end. Red Antiquities, the Tomb of Wind, and some new monsters. Harbinger, Shadow Caps, etc. That is the Red Mausoleum. A really interesting, you know, not that long adventure for levels 12 through 15, which is just super rare. I, I don't run into those almost ever. High, high level adventures <clears throat> like that. Uh, the last one I want <clears throat> Wow, excuse me. The last one I wanted to cover is the Curse of the Witch Head, which is a level for level six, uh, an adventure for level six through 10. This is only for four to six people. So it's a little bit smaller, you're still higher level than a lot of adventures you run into, at least that I run into all the time. But it's an interesting one. Over two centuries ago, the Duke Isinga ordered an underground complex to be built to house the Witch Head and keep it from those who would use its powers for evil. The construction of the complex was performed in a remote and secret place. Its chambers and corridors filled with traps and terrors devised by his new court wizard. With the complex completed, the laborers were enchanted to never reveal its location. He knew he could not destroy the Witch Head, for it was forever linked to the vitality of his family line. 
Its power was fueled by the evil deeds of his forebearers, and it was written in legend that the heir who destroyed the relic would be the last of the line. Last month, good Duke Imris received a secret message from a band of fellow of outlawed adventurers. The witch head had been discovered. The outlaws swore that unless the duke hands over to them his own only heir, his daughter Derica, they would use the powers of the relic to wreak havoc on the countryside and bring his rule to a crashing end. Can a hardy band of adventurers put down the ancient evil, or will it rise again? That's an interesting background for an adventure. This one's 13 pages, so it's a little shorter than the other adventures we've seen. But once again, art is fantastic. The cover artist is not is not Stephen Poek, it's Bradley McDevitt. John uh, Bingham again does the interior art. So once again, you have the introduction, uh, you have the background information of what's going on here, and then you have um, the dungeon itself. It's pretty, you know, you jump right into it. There's not a lot of preamble. The dungeon is really well laid out. I like it quite a lot, actually. There's a lot of loops. There are lots of interesting things going on here. The, I'm always a fan of underground lakes. <laughs> I just like that. There's some really interesting room descriptions, and the names of the rooms are almost always good. That's something I, maybe you've noticed already, but the names of the rooms are very flavorful and kind of give you a sense of what's going on there. It's not the, again, not the best layout I've ever seen, not my favorite layout I've ever seen, but it is good and it's well written. That's one thing that I say for all these adventures so far and all the ones that I've read in the Advanced Adventure series is that they're well written. I haven't run into a bad adventure yet. The Chamber of Illumination. There's some chests in here. There's a golem got to fight. Uh, you know, this is a pretty standard dungeon delve, in my opinion. It's a pretty standard dungeon delve. With a lot of, you know, interesting stuff. The Witch Head itself is an interesting magic item. And then you get the out, uh, the outlaws themselves. And this is one of the cool things I think about this adventure, is that the, the monsters you're fighting are really... I mean, there are some monsters down here. But the major NPCs are all detailed with descriptions and, like, you know, you get the sense that these are people. And that's really cool that the outlaws each have their own thing going on and they're each interesting in their own way. I like adventures like that where your villains aren't generic orcs or even like one generic villain where you have a crew of them and they're each different. That allows you to maybe play them against each other. That would be really... Uh, the players can play them against each other. That's really cool. You get the witch head here, which is a relic. It's a powerful magic item. You cast suggestion at no cost. Mass charm once per day. But it ages the possessor three years when you cast that. <clears throat> It has a lot of very, very powerful spells. And so the fact that you can cast Suggestion once per day, that's insane. Or, sorry, not once per day, just at, at will, no cost. Just cast Suggestion over and over and over. That's a very powerful ability. Leaving, leaving the others aside. You have new encounters here, the Room of Purpose, um, an oubliette, and the solution to it. Or uh, uh, a Room of Solution. <clears throat> I'm really sorry, my coughing. Uh, then you have the Appendix of New Monsters, a Labyrinthine Golem, a Prison Ward, uh, a Rancid, and the Open Gaming License. So, the Curse of the Witch Head <clears throat> is a really cool adventure, and I highly recommend it as well. I'm going to end this video before I lose my voice entirely, guys. So, there was the, the Curse of the Witch Head, the Red Mausoleum, and then the three adventures from the Shadow Vein series by Advanced Adventures. I'll put links below to where you can get them. Again, they're all designed for Osric, but they're simple enough you could convert them to any OSR, even 5e if you really wanted, uh, OSR game. But the ideas in these books are great, and the dungeons are well designed, and I think especially the Pod, uh, the, the pod Cavern series, the, the Shadow Vein series, is really good. That idea of going along the underground river, that's a really flavorful idea. I love that a lot. I hope you guys found this interesting, and I'll see you in another video.